I do want to say before we begin, I am not going anywhere. Um, while well, I am being ordained officially in Indianapolis at my home church, I will be back. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to, you know, clear that up. <laughs> All right, will you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in thine sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We started today with some breath prayers, breathing in light, breathing out peace. And sometimes it is very hard to breathe out peace. I joke that even though I work in a church, I pray the most in my car. <laughs> Breathing out God's peace so other things don't come out with that breath. <laughs> Our scripture today is from the book of Exodus where like me, like many of us, the Israelites are having some hard time breathing out peace, and instead they are breathing out some real big grumbling. Now let's position ourselves with where those Israelites are. By chapter 16, the Israelites have been through slavery. They have been in captivity in Egypt. They have experienced the plagues. They experienced that bomb of a song, let my people go, and Pharaoh indeed was defeated. The Israelites crossed the Red Sea, the Sea of Reeds, into the wilderness, making their way to Mount Sinai, making their way to the land of milk and honey that was promised to them. They left slavery, they are in the wilderness, and they have been told that there is hope for a future. And so in chapter 16, we find the Israelites grumbling in the desert. And let's take a moment and imagine ourselves into that story. Let's imagine ourselves into that community where we too are in the desert, where we too have been traveling for two months through the wilderness, where we have escaped from slavery. We have escaped from prosecution and daily torture and the awfulness that was captivity. And the text says, the whole congregation of the Israelites set out and came to the wilderness, and the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And so in those grumbles, what Moses and Aaron hear is a longing for this time of captivity and slavery. And at first, I just brushed it off as the Israelites grumbling, because let's be honest, the Israelites grumble most of the time in their stories. <laughs> but by imagining myself into it, I'm able to empathize with them and, thinking, and start thinking about why is it that they were indeed longing for this time in Egypt, where all that they knew was pain and suffering? Well, they are still knowing pain and suffering, but now they're hangry. And they're remembering, at the very least, when they were in Egypt, they were kept fed, they were kept watered. At the very least, their basic needs were being met. And so that is what they are longing for. But there's a phenomenon that happens after we've moved through a time of pain and trial, after we've got some physical and temporal distance from that time of trial. Um, let's say high school. 
For some, that's a time of trial. But at the end of those four years, we put on what are called graduation goggles. And instead of remembering the, the swirlies and the being shoved into the locker, what we do remember is the friendships and the feelings of accomplishment that we might have had. We might remember some communities or sports teams that we joined. We remember all of those good things with our graduation goggles. And we forget about all of the bad stuff. That's what the Israelites are doing. Um, in a contemporary-ish, it came out mid-2000s, which should be contemporary, um, a TV show called How I Met Your Mother. Um, yes, I am relating How I Met Your Mother to the sacred text of the Bible. <laughs> One of the characters, Robin Sherbatsky, grew up dreaming of being a journalist, a serious journalist who delivered groundbreaking news, who held up the integrity of journalism, and she finds herself into a station called Metro News One, where instead she's reporting on things like kids being locked in a um, claw machine um, or, you know, whatever new puppies there are at the um, Humane Society, all of which are important things to know about. But it's not exactly what she was hoping for. For example, one of the news stories that she has to report on is a serious story. A train came off the rails and actually killed people. But then her writers had her say, as a bit of a teaser, come back to us after commercials for the shocking derails of the story. Now, I'm a real big fan of puns, but that's a bad one. And Robin Scherbatsky has had enough she has decided that she's going to leave this job and pursue something else to go along with who she feels called to be, a journalist. And so she leaves, she gives this terrible speech of goodbye, and she goes, and she doesn't get the job that she was interviewing for. And so there's another job that she doesn't get, and then she's passed over again for a job. And she's starting to realize that maybe those puns weren't awful. So she begs and pleads for her job back, and she makes the evening news that night, and she's telling the story of a cute little newborn panda who got his first tooth at Central Park Zoo, making him a molar bear. <laughs> she says she's done, and she walks away. Because sometimes those things that we just can't let go of aren't going to change. And while it was great for Robin in her early career to do that work, it was not where she was meant to be in the long term. Right? But we put on those graduation goggles, we put on those Egyptian slavery goggles, and we just focus on having our basic needs met because we don't share enough and we don't trust enough in God's dream of that land of milk and honey. We're too in the wilderness. We're too into trying to get those basic needs met to see that ahead. And the same thing happens with the Israelites. And so there are two additional things that happen that not only let me feel a bit more grace for the Israelites, but a bit more grace for myself in those things that I was still holding on to. You see, the first um, is a bit harsh. Um, God responds to these peoples, to the Israelites grumbling by promising that God will rain down manna or flakes of bread every single day for them to collect except for the Sabbath. And now when that happens, they're going to get real excited because there's food all over when they wake up. And they're coming from a time of scarcity that it's a natural inclination to gather up as much as they possibly could. They don't know where their next meal is going to come from, even though God has told them every single day forever. 
but they still hold on to the manna, even though they were warned against it. So the next day, they find that that manna has turned rotten. It has turned maggoty and spoiled and no longer good for eating. But there's fresh manna outside. They go out, the morning dew has risen, and there's new stuff for them to collect, and they are nourished again for that day. Some of them, I'm sure, still collected extra to make sure they had some through the night, to make sure they had some for breakfast, and still the next day, that manna was rotten, and it was spoiled, but there was new stuff outside. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. And every single day that God promised them there would be, there was fresh manna outside. And I'm sure that there were Israelites still on that 40th year who were still collecting extra, who were still finding that it was rotten and maggoty the next day. I've been practicing trusting God for 33 years, and I haven't gotten it right. Does it get easier at 40? It's our inclination to hold on. It's our inclination to put on those graduation goggles. It's that inclination to stay in what we know because we perceive that as safety. Because we're not sharing and trusting in God's dream of going to the land of milk and honey. And we're not trusting that God is walking with us every single step of the way. But I said there were two things. The second comes later. Um, Later in verses 27 and 28, Israelites are still not following God's instructions. And the text says, The Lord says to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? And I I hear anger, I hear frustration, I hear God rolling God's eyes and saying, people, how long will it take you? But God isn't passing that anger on to the Israelites. It says, the Lord said to Moses. The Israelites are coming from a time of incredible trial, of trauma, of pain, and they are healing. They are trying their best day in and day out. And whatever frustration God might be feeling at them not getting it quick enough, God's giving to an intermediary. Because God knows that the Israelites need whatever time they need to heal both on their time and on God's time. To trust that God is indeed walking with them, providing for them, day in and day out through their grumbling until they reach that land of milk and honey. That is our God. Our God is one of big hopes and big dreams. Our God is a God who was there in the past, who liberated the Israelites, who was a warrior, who rained down plagues on Egypt to set God's people free. And when they were walking in the wilderness and when they just needed proof that God was with them every single day, God showed up. You see, back in chapter 3 of Exodus, God reveals God's name to Moses as I am who I am. Modern scholars are interpreting it as I will be who I will be. We can interpret it as I will be who you need me to be. This week, our Jewish siblings celebrated Rosh Hashanah. 
and that is a celebration of the Jewish New Year. And one of the rituals of the Ashkenazi Jews is called Tashlich, in which they take bread in their hand. They stand by some flowing water, and they say some blessings, and they let it go. This is something that they did every, that they do every single year. The bread in their hand, and they let it go. God had the Israelites practice that on the daily. Collect up what it is you need for today. And then let it go. Take what you need for today. And then let it go. You see, by letting go of those crumbs in our hands, we can have our hands open to receive that manna of the next day, to participate in God's dream of the land of milk and honey, no matter how long it takes us. Because our God is a God who is, who was, and who will be. Through our grumbles, for however long it takes for us to reach that land of milk and honey, for however long it takes for us to truly be able to breathe out peace. Amen.